And now uh, it starts uh, uh, questions and answers. And but before that, uh, there, there was this really uh, group effort uh, regarding translation, uh, trans translating our website, and many people from outside uh, really uh, contributed. So uh, thank you, uh, Sinji. Thank you, Raul, Eva, Anduli uh Kara, Mike Kangansky, uh, like just to name a few there was really uh, many people uh we are currently <clears throat> trying to make the process slightly less painful uh and as you as you could read in the public chat and we will be uh moving to a, a better uh workflow um and of course keeping using what we already use uh, in the product which is the, the web -like. Yeah, so, so that's it. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, cool. Um, particularly Rick's talk on, the, on translation is very helpful for me as a totally spoiled English speaker. So I, I apologize in advance for, <laughs> uh, for that, but uh, it's, it's fantastic the work you do uh, to communicate the, the weird things that we say, no doubt, in, in English. So fantastic. So if speakers or everybody can just share their videos, uh, any questions uh, for anyone there for tour on, on iOS uh, goodness or uh, canvas, canvas funkiness from uh, Dennis or uh, one on one. I hope uh, Alexandria is still with us uh, to, to answer questions or uh, new features in Android or uh, fuzzing, fuzzing craziness. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we have we have some questions. So for Alexandria. <laughs> Um, do you have any changes uh, to the mobile tablet CSS or surviving without patching those? <laughs> Is that a possibility to improve the branding JS and CSS mechanism in any way? Uh, the thing is that uh, I think for uh, mobile or uh, iPad, there are other applications and uh, what we are working on, uh, as far as I know, is just for the desktop and uh, big screens. So we haven't really doubled into small screens that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because like you, uh, you will actually get the, the mobile screen, uh, sorry, mobile view, even uh, even like when you when you look at the web page on the mobile view, like not not in the app. I didn't mean the app with the question, but about uh, the you know fat uh, sorry the the browser uh, browser app uh, but like uh, seen on the mobile the mobile device so I was wondering like if you run in into any issues there um, patching this or well but I hear that, that, that you didn't as, care uh, so far as far as I know when a user mm -hmm. uh, mobile user uh, logs into the portal they are redirected to um, some uh, optimized version of the portal which includes even fewer applications so uh, uh, fortunately we we didn't really take a look at that our focus is mainly on uh, bigger screens Understood. okay so i don't think we we get a lot of uh, mobile users because they can't really get to the uh, higher screen uh, version let's say they're already directed elsewhere into an optimized uh, portal for strictly for mobile usage. I see. I see. And the other question was uh, because like the the repack, repacking of the of the bundle sounds uh, fragile <laughs> to me. So I was wondering like if you considered using the branding JS branding CSS that uh, that we have as kind of like extension mechanism uh, for you know adding your own stuff uh, or like you didn't consider that at all and uh, and prefer like having it just when one bundle or you know how, how that how this feels for you um actually it's it's not really that fragile because uh we are actually triggering the regular build uh the regular mm -hmm. cool build before so we are triggering that we have a dist folder i mean we there's a, the regular this folder with the, the bundles, the bundle.js, mm -hmm. bundle.css, and every static resource. 
And after that, we basically patch those files by add, by uh, either appending or prepending um, uh, our customizations to the CSS and the JavaScript respectively. Um, this suffers a bit more of a freedom because yeah, uh, we can we can decide if we need uh, other alterations to the process. Um, I guess uh, having everything into branding JS might also work, but uh, we we went through through this route instead. Okay. Cool. So I had a question for Dennis. Are you with us, Dennis, still? Or are you, uh, maybe he's uh, it's a bit late. You know? uh, Dennis couldn't be present at all. So, oh, yes, sure. uh, so let me tell you something good about Dennis. This is, so we've, we've also, uh, Dennis has recently come up with a very nice fix uh, around zooming. So that as you zoom, it picks the, the perfect uh, zoom level uh, that has the most tiles to show on your screen um, so that you actually get this beautiful fluid uh, zooming experience. Even if you just zoomed and you hit a new zoom level and we haven't quite finished getting tiles, or if you're zooming right out, having having zoomed in very heavily, we then have very big tiles or a very little amount of the screen. And typically when you zoomed out previously, you then see this sort of small white blob of your document descending into the distance. Uh, but now we should smoothly uh, switch to a different zoom level and interpolate from that uh, if we had it cached. So it should just give a much more uh, fluid a zooming panning experience uh, around uh, from your cache without needing uh, the kit process to render new stuff. So yeah, well, that's pretty cool. Anything else? Other questions, comments, thoughts? We should do the light break, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I wanted one for Miklos. Um, so, so, so Miklos, in terms of um, finding problems, how many of those problems when you first start escape, do you think, into the wild? I mean, how, how quickly do we find a problem from introduction to actually catching it in the fuzzer, typically? Uh, I think that depends on um, how the problem is relating to the, to our current coverage. So if it's something that we already covered, just it was good before, and now it's bad, then it's instant. And I can yeah. just introduce some obvious null point or the reference in the main loop, and you will find it instantly. And uh, similarly, the other end of the range is that uh, in case it's a problem in some um, some area which was um, uh, which was not covered before at all, then it takes a while. But um, I think um, like what uh, uh, what Kalem was uh, saying is that if a file format fuzzle is running for a month and they did not find anything, then you can start to sleep good. <laughs> <laughs> So I have that's, a that's obviously for for quite uh, quite a complex file format. So probably for our WebSocket parsing, perhaps uh, even after a week, we can be quite a bit. Uh, Miklos, um, on that, uh, have you have you found any um, smart tips for balancing um, running the fuzzer for a long time versus restarting it every so often? Do you have any any tips? The, uh, the, the current balance we have is that like the way you know some rest and set up the Jenkins job is that we time out after a week so in case we don't find anything then we give up and we pull and, and start a new baseline after a week uh, but other than that there is value in this long running job so that it can actually focus on building the coverage rather than again and again pulling a new baseline and not getting anything so see it's certainly a trade-off yeah I agreed it's it's a trick Ash muted himself just as he was talking, but never mind. Um, actually, <laughs> there was there was a software. Um, oh, was it? Ah, oh, someone or, else is muting you. Else. Look at that. Maybe, maybe oh, that sounds really else. fun. Let me try that. Really. Excellent. <laughs> Sorry, Ash. Um, what did, did, what did you I, say? I was I was just saying that I um, I had noticed that um, um, uh, sometimes when I uh, restarted the the fuzzer, um, it would branch um, uh, to a, to broader um, cases more quickly than if I let it run for a long time. Sometimes it would get into um, a sort of a, a branch that's very narrow and it tries to optimize around a certain area without trying necessarily, um, you know, um, uh, uh, more mutations across the board. 
because it, it kind of starts to prune the tree if 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 you if you know what I mean. And I, I just noticed that by accident, whenever I restarted, it would hit more branches very quickly uh, than if I let it run more than say four or five hours. It would it kind of get into a very stable situation where it tries uh, minor uh, mutations versus broad ones. Anyway, it's an interesting topic. It also <laughs> probably depends on uh, what is your current coverage. So the behavior is probably different if you have near zero versus near 100 percent coverage. I, I do sometimes wonder if it sort of ends up trying to get past some uh, secure crypt key signing algorithm to the other end or something, you know, and, and uh, it is trying to solve essentially an unsolvable problem with great computational cost by, by disappearing off down some, some path. Anyway, cool. Um, any other questions? I, I have one more random one. Yes. That's absolutely root. It's for you. Um, so here we go. So what's the hardest word to translate from English into Portuguese that you've, you've struggled with? Ah, uh, I don't know. I, I think uh, uh, in general, loose technical terms uh, can be quite hard, especially because in the last, I'm going to say, 20 to 30 years, um, there is this growing tendency of not translating uh, technical terms, even when there are uh, equivalents. And so people uh, fall out of, like, those terms fall out of use somehow. So be, they kind of become, um, you know, antiquated or something like that. Um, and it can be a quite challenging, uh, uh, for instance, and especially if you work with a team of developers and they will go to you, why, why did you not leave the word download as download? It's like, because download is not it's not a Portuguese word. <laughs> and so, uh, um, so anything that it's a loose technical term, uh, uh, and when I say loose, it's like a standalone, uh, not loose, but like a standalone technical term can be quite challenging. Um, and uh, and yeah, anything that is very new technology uh, is always a challenge because you have to make the decision of whether you translate it kind of literally and it can sound really odd um or you just leave the english uh which is also not what a translator should do like obviously for some terms like internet is internet everywhere i'm not going to translate internet the french tried that and went very very terribly um i object i object it's just <laughs> <not> true <laughs> um but yeah, like uh, technical terms are always a challenge. Um, but in that regard, I have to say that the Brazilian Portuguese do a much better uh, work than the European Portuguese people. Uh, but I think it's also to do with uh, how big they are um, and how, uh, yeah, they're translated for uh, 200 million people. We translate for 10 million people and it's very different. Uh, we get a lot of foreign content in our daily lives and are just so used to English that sometimes you don't even notice it anymore. Um, so, uh, yes, I think Brazilian Portuguese people are more used to, like, genuinely translating uh, documentation uh, and technical stuff uh, than the Portuguese. So they very often, uh, for instance, when I'm translating something to European Portuguese that is very technical, I try to see if there's already a Portuguese, uh, Brazilian Portuguese version of that. And more often than not, there is, which is good. Um, and then I try to, I either use, I either use that term directly or try to find something that it's uh, close enough. Um, rename Portuguese to Brazilian. I'm not against that. I think it may, <laughs> uh, I, I'll probably lose my nationality by saying this, but I'm not against that. Uh, I think they have. Uh, it's it's a much bigger country, um, and and I think it makes sense that they kind of um, does, uh, kind of define the paths of language. I mean, language is something that is always changing, uh, and that's great it's like it's a living being um and uh, in european portuguese because uh, our uh, geopolitical importance is very small we tend to just grab stuff and and i think because in the last 30 years a lot more people 
learn English and now are fluent in English, it's just easy to grab it. And it, it's just terrible because it really devalues uh, our own language. Um, so I'm all pro uh, Brazilian Portuguese taking over because they just translate everything. And sometimes it's weird, <laughs> but uh, but it really works and it's a way to to um, um, to to really make sure that your language is still living and that things make sense. And 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 actually, regarding technical things, I think there is. Uh, an obvious gap between, for instance, developers who obviously are working in English regardless and people who will need to use the documentation. And sometimes we assume that everybody speaks English when they don't. So if you uh, keep a lot of English terms populating your text, it just creates a very confusing experience for someone who is not uh, familiar with the language or doesn't have as much um, fluency as a coder will probably have because it works in English. So, um, yeah, so uh, PT and PTBR are not completely the same due to the new agreement. The new agreement is the spelling. So there was a spelling agreement um, that had the, um, the goal was to make the both, both Portuguese norms come closer together because Brazilian Portuguese and European Portuguese can be quite different. Um, I think it's more obvious when people speak than when people write, but you can easily see whether a text is uh, Brazilian Portuguese or European Portuguese by the way uh, verbs are used or um, second person uh, uh, pronouns are used as well. Um, uh, the LATAM Spanish, uh, I think it, uh, like regarding uh, Spanish and Portuguese and I guess French in a way as well, because there's uh, European French, Canadian French and uh, all these other varieties. Um, it can, it, the one that you pick, it really comes down to uh, your business, the uh, in business wise. Okay. So what are your goals? Do you want to be in Europe? uh and other african uh, countries that are using portuguese or do you want to market to brazilian um, i think the, the joy of it being open source if i can interrupt Rudy, is that of course you can have it always you know and you yes. can have your own native language as you like it and be involved in translation yes. so it's, it's and you can also yeah. sorry and and for some i think for portuguese is quite hard i tried to do that and it was very challenging but uh for some languages you can kind of create hybrids so for instance soundcloud they use what uh, uh, they call it international english so it's english that may not be completely uh normal for an english native speaker but it will sound okay for most people that speak english in the world and most speak people that speak english in the world are not necessarily native speakers so they created their own blend of like hybrid English that works uh, in software and in music and uh, and for what they're doing. Uh, in Aptoid, we did the same with uh, with um, with Spanish. So we had a hybrid um, version of Spanish that kind of worked for most Spanish speakers. Uh, and it was basically a blend of um european spanish and mexican spanish because mexico had our biggest spanish um audience i guess uh and so we kind of blended the two uh, but that's something that you can really work with uh your um uh, your team of translation uh, translators whether they're volunteer or not it doesn't matter where you, like get them to work together and come up with like text that works in both languages because obviously you can translate in many varieties but uh, that also comes with uh extra challenges especially especially uh in in regards of maintenance so you might have someone who will translate say a european portuguese version of the software uh one year but then uh, they can't keep up with the updates or whatever, and then it's just uh, a weird thing. Or you can build like defaults. So like 
If there isn't an equivalent in European Portuguese, just default to the Brazilian Portuguese. It might be a weird thing, and sometimes there are weird things. Um, but it's better than nothing, obviously. To have, have yeah, it's there. a it's a fallback. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you, Ruth. It's really good to hear your enthusiasm and passion and knowledge uh, for it all. Um, I'm sure we probably have more questions, and we could probably talk about this all day. But I'm getting hungry, and uh, hopefully you are. Thank you so much for uh, for all of the talks, all the presenters. It's really uh, great to see you. Um, I think it's about 45, uh, 40 minutes now, and uh, we'll be back uh, for the next round. So thanks, everyone. Yes. Have a great lunch. Thanks. Bye-bye.